Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. Hello, Land Geek Nation, for this week's roundtable podcast. We've got the usual suspects, and um, we're doing something a little fun today on Zoom. We're actually going to try to go live on Facebook right now, so I'm going to try to do this. And as I do this, we have a few topics to discuss with the usual suspects. We've got the big papa, Tate Litchfield. We've got the technician, Eric Peterson. Bearland Aaron, living in Amish country. We've got the terrorist hunter, Mimi Schmidt. And we've got the go-giver, Jeannie Morum, of course. And last but not least, you know him. You love him. Six Sigma. I don't even know. He's got so many new nicknames now. The Brain, The Professor. It's Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And if you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash The Land Geek. So I'm going to start streaming the, uh, the podcast right now in the group. We'll see if we get any questions. So it looks like it's, uh, it's working here. All right. So... Um, we've got a few topics uh, to discuss on this fine day after Labor Day, by the way. So it's interesting when you don't have a job to go to. What do you do on Labor Day? Right? <laughs> um, like, is your Labor Day any different than any other day? Like, is it just like, oh, here's a good way to get a sale? Like, Jeannie, like, what do you, what do, you do on Labor Day? I was... I was actually mailing. I, I was home. I, I wasn't out on the, in the pool or anything. I was, I was actually working. You were working. All right, cool. Um, Eric Peterson, what'd you do on Labor Day? Well, the kids were home from school, so uh, we just kind of took it easy. I did a little bit of work in the morning, but um, yeah, just spent the afternoon and the rest of the day just hanging out. Yeah, yeah. Mimi, I could imagine... Did you, at the Department of Defense, did you even get days off? Was, was there even such things as Labor Day? Well, yeah, the, well, the government would have the day off, but then the consulting companies that we work for didn't a lot of times. So we'd go in. Uh, sometimes they'd let you work on their stuff. Other times we'd have to like, find research projects for the staff. So R&D days, a lot of times. Okay, okay. Um, so did you have a good Labor Day? I did. I found this um, sports bar on top of the Hampton Inn that overlooks the Nats baseball stadium. So I didn't have to pay all this money for uh, tickets. We just went up there and watched a couple innings of the game. I didn't even have to stay the whole time. Um, the Cardinals beat the Nationals, but it was still a fun time. Go Redbirds. Yeah. All I had to pay for was valeting my car. It was great. I'll do that again. That's amazing. Tate, yeah. I guess you took a, like a longer bike ride than normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, it was kind of a just normal Monday for us. We just rode bikes, uh, had a barbecue, swam in the pool, looked at some emails, but uh, kept it pretty easy. Yeah. Beerland Aaron, how about you? We, uh, there was this festival right in – our area called the blueberry festival and about 500,000 people show up to attend it. And, uh, for fundraising for our marching band, we park cars in on a private, you know, like a private five acres or something like that. And, uh, so Thursday or Friday through Monday for about from 7 AM till 9 PM, I parked cars in the hot sun. So I got my full year's worth of labor, in those four days. So kind of the opposite of everybody else. Very cool. Very cool. Scott Todd, Monday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that's, it's all the same day for you, isn't it? it uh, really yeah. I mean, I really couldn't tell you the difference between Friday or Monday. Like I didn't even realize it was a holiday. I'm like, <laughs> kids go to school. And they're like, we're off from school, dad. I'm like, all right, prove it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like a harder work day. I'm a little hung up with what Bearland said, though. Did he say they parked cars or Amish buggies? I yeah, we parked cars, Scott. We parked cars. 
I'm confused. They just uh, feed the horses. You don't have to park them. Yeah, there you go. You guys, look, don't mess with Bearland Aaron. He's a, he, he rides motorcycles. You know, he's going to go all sons of anarchy on you guys at boot camp. So this, you know, I wouldn't mess around. So um, let's segue to actually our topic for discussion, which comes up a lot, uh, which is probate. Do we do probate deals? Do we look hard at probate deals? What do you do if the deal is a probate deal? And just for clarification, Eric Peterson, do you want to just define for Land Geek listening nation what a probate deal is? Sure, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so a property that requires probate to be transferred um, is basically one where the parties on the deed um, have passed away and there was no um, executor of the, of the will assigned, the will wasn't in place that, that transferred the property somewhere else. So what has to happen is um, depending on the estate and how it gets settled, a lawyer gets involved, they assign a representative and there's this whole process of legal filings that has to be done in order to basically clean the title and, and move it to uh, potentially some heir. Um, that's my non-legal definition. Okay, great. And Tate Litchfield, what are the negatives of a probate deal? Well, they take forever. I think that's the biggest negative. Um, sometimes you can't even, I mean, when I come across a property that needs to go through probate, personally, we walk away from it. Uh, we don't spend any time working on any property or deal that we can't buy immediately. So if you don't have legal right to sell the property, go get that legal right and then come back to me when you have it. That's and, our approach. And Jeannie, let's say that it's a probate deal. And um, I stay away from them. You stay away from them. Mm -hmm. I've actually okay. um, talked to Tate about it and Mike, but I, I just move on but because I don't have the experience as the rest of you gentlemen and, and uh, Mimi. So at this point in my, you know, working um, process, I, I just move on. Okay. Yeah, Barely and Aaron, how about you? Any probate deals that you would do? If, if the sale value of the property was high enough, I might consider helping the probate along, but I haven't run across any that made that like fiscally worth it to me. Um, I, I get them all the time that need probate and I just, I let the per person know. Sometimes I'll give them, depending on the state, give them a website that'll give them some information um, and let them decide if they want to pursue it or not. And um, if they decide that it's worth it to them to pursue it, um, to get back a hold of me when it's finished and then the property's in their name legally. But like Tate, you know, I don't, I'm not going to really spend any time screwing with it. Yeah. Now Mimi Schmidt has a really good recent probate story. Mimi, you, do you want to share what happened? Sure. I got a accepted offer last summer. My acquisitions manager took it and it was probate issue. And so that's one of the questions on the intake process, right? Whose names are on the, on the deed? And so she explained to him, you know, we can't do this. You'd have to take it through probate. And so the thought that this was the son, um, the, the parents both had passed and owned some other properties too. So he thought it would behoove them to go through probate because there were multiple properties, not just that one. Cause sometimes if it's just one property that it costs more in probate than the property's worth. Right. So, right. um, he kept in touch with my acquisitions manager. He just emailed her every once in a while to give her a status. So he finally closed maybe a month ago. And so he came back and we closed. I bought the property. But then my issue was I had all this paperwork from him, the death certificates. Uh, I had a will, a domiciliary letter, and order of summary administration. I didn't even know what these were, right? So I uh, filed the death certificate, the summary of order summary of administration and the deed. And it first got kicked back because 
he had filed the, the order of summary administration in Marion County. And so my county in Florida won't let me file paperwork if it's been certified in another county. So I had to get a certified copy. So my acquisitions manager had to literally send them a request, get the certified, you know, the certificate stamp on the document. But then we, she just uploaded those three again, right? Just modified that one and they took it last Friday. So it, uh, it wasn't, the only extra work was now, you know, now we know what paperwork, she and I both know what paperwork has to be filed. And we had to get the certified copy of the one that had already been filed in a different county. So that was the only additional work. Okay, great, great. But otherwise you would have passed on the deal if they didn't yeah. do the legal expense of doing it. Yeah, I had really had no expectation that I'd that we would hear from him again. So it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, I mean, Scott Todd, are there any deals where you look at a probate deal, do the math and say, okay, this is worth the time. This is worth the money. I'm going to close on this. Even if it takes six months, I might use a service like taxtitleservices.com to maybe help me with this. Well, tax title services can't do a probate. They can clean up, you know, they can clean up um, something that needs to be quiet titled, like through a tax. Right, right, right. But um, Mark, like one, one of the things that I, I've done is in the states that I work in, I have gone and um, look, most attorneys, they give you a free consultation for like an hour. They're happy to meet with you to see what you have. And, you know, like what I've done is I've taken some of these deals that, that need to be probated and I've gone to them and said, look, here's, here's a deal that needs to be probated that I turned out. So, you know, what would you charge to, to take this thing through probate? And, you know, find an attorney that's reasonable and literally any attorney in the state can do it. It doesn't have to be an attorney in, in that county. It can be an attorney in the state. Um, so you got to be careful of that. But you can, you can also look at a county, an attorney in that county. But typically, it's the, you know, they're, they're licensed by that state. And they'll do it for the whole state. So you go, you go to an attorney, you get your free consultation. They will tell you, okay, for me to do this, here's the price and here's what I need back from you or here's what I would need in order to pursue this. And so then you, know, you take, make this as part of your, 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 your checklist. And typically, like in some of the states I've worked in, if, if the property has gone through probate in another state, just not in the state where the land is located, it's typically about $1,500. So I kind of have these attorneys that I know I would call and I always make the offer like, okay, listen, I can't buy it today, but if you can provide me with this information or you can provide the attorney with this information, the cost is $1,500. I will uh, deduct that from what I'm going to pay you or I'll deduct it from my offer amount and then I'll pay you the difference. And I, I can tell you like, I've made this offer so many times that people just keep saying no, or I'll think about it. They just walk away. And literally last, last month in, in August, I actually had a guy that said, okay, like I got to get rid of the land. So if you can help me, no problem. We had offered 2,500, 1,500 for the probate piece. We told him that when it was done, he would get a thousand dollars. And he's like, okay, sounds good to me. And then I was like, uh, okay, now we got to get the attorney involved. So it's, it's, it's a little unusual. It's a little weird. And then it turns out that I had to pay the attorney like the $1,500 up front. So I'm like, man, if this guy doesn't go through or can't produce this stuff, this will be the last time ever I ever make that offer. So that's the risk, right? I'm risking $1,500 or some portion of it because if, if he doesn't go all the way through, he's not going to bill me. But I am risking some money at play that this guy is going to come through. And that's why I think that in the beginning – it's best just to say like, no, I'm not going to buy it. Go, go do what Mimi did. Go fix it and bring it back to me. Because while you're involved in that and you're trying to figure out all these pieces, you know what? Everybody else is just buying land and they're selling land. So wh which one do you want to do? Because until you have these systems in place that you can actually assign an intake manager, hey, just keep following up with this attorney, man, it's your time and your time is limited. So you got to pick the highest returning uh, priorities. Yeah, that's great. I, before I comment on that, I just want to say that we have been successful in streaming live on Facebook. If you're watching this live or you're watching it on Facebook, I would say tune in next week because we're going to do this again. Um, and we could do a round table where we just answer questions on 
Facebook Live. Um, and then I would say that in order for you to continue listening, go to your podcatcher or uh, iTunes or Spotify or whatever it is to listen to the rest of the Art of Passive Income podcast. Every Thursday, we do release the Roundtable podcasts. And then every Tuesday, we have um, our special guests that are experts. So please do that. And uh, I'm going to stop streaming. So now let's talk about, so we, get, we talked about probate. I kind of briefly mentioned, so for, the most of, for most of us, like just quick show of hands, you know, Tate, you'll pass on probate, right? Jeannie passes on probate. Aaron, Barely Aaron passes on probate. Mimi would do it if they already did it. Jeannie's a pass. And uh, Eric, what's your take now? So I've done it uh, in the way Scott described where I um, actually hired the attorney. Uh, the difference is um, I didn't pay the attorney till the work was done, um, but it did take forever. I mean, it took four months, I feel like, maybe longer. Um, so, I mean, if there's enough money in the deal, I'll do it, um, but I'm more likely to say, go take care of it yourself after being through it. Yeah, how much money did you make on your deal? Um, I made pretty good money on that. Um, it was actually two properties. Um, I think I only paid the, the seller a dollar cause I had to pay for the probate and, um, those properties defaulted at least once, uh, um, sold for close to 10,000 on terms. Oh, wow. It's so, not a bad deal. Not bad. That's not bad. Wow. Pretty good. Um, and if those ever happen to come across your desk again, Eric, you know, you can always partner with me. I've got 50 cents right now in my pocket that I would split that deal with you. So don't, don't think I've got a shortage of change. So now a different sort of subject that's kind of similar is a treasury deed, a treasurer's deed. So Scott Todd, do you want to just define for everybody the treasurer's deed? What, what is that? Yeah, so what happens is when a property uh, goes through the tax deed process and it doesn't get purchased, at, or when it gets purchased at the tax deed process, what happens is the tax collector will issue either a treasurer's deed or sometimes it's called a tax deed, one of those two things. And when that deed comes out, it's, it's basically no different than a quick claim deed is what it is. It's like the county's just basically quick claiming you the property. They're like, here, just take it. We, we don't know nothing about it. It owes no delinquent taxes because those have been paid, but we don't know who the owner is. We're thinking that you're the owner, you're good. And so, you know, I can buy a property from the tax deed auction, which is not a problem. And I can turn around, I can sell it. I can sell it on terms. I can sell it for cash. I can do it. I can sell it. It's not a big deal. However, what is a big deal is if I decide or my buyer decides that they're going to want title insurance on this property. So let's, let's look at why they want title insurance. Well, maybe because they want to go build a property on this uh, or build a house on this particular property. And they're going to go to the bank. The bank is going to want them to have title insurance. The bank is going to want that title to be clean with, with someone protecting it or standing behind it. So that's the need for the title insurance. So if they're gonna go build and they're gonna build like right away, well then they're gonna to wanna to take that, that land through the title process and if they do, a title insurance company is gonna look at it and say, well we can't give you clear title on it or we can't give you title insurance on it because it went through the tax deed process. Now every state has um, an amount of time in which it kind of like, they determine that the owner is you. And you know, like for example, in Florida, I think it's uh, three years. I think uh, four years uh, in Colorado, I think it's seven years, like every state's going to be different. And if you try to go sell the land, like let's use Colorado, you try to sell the land within seven years, no problem. Like other people can buy it. Anybody can buy it, but a title insurance company will not, will not give you title insurance until after the seven year mark, after it's been cleared for seven years. Now that said, uh, it, it, it confuses people like, should they buy these things or should they not buy them? And we can talk about each person's individual strategies on buying them or not buying them. 
However, you know, you can, you can resolve that problem by taking it through a process called quiet title. That means you're hiring an attorney again and taking it through the process of, of clearing all the other owners. Depending on fees and how many owners there were in the chain of title, it could cost anywhere from 2000 to, you know, uh, $5,000 to take it through a quiet title process. Otherwise, you can use a service like the tax title services that you mentioned earlier, which could be as, as low as like $1,600 to, to clear that title. So, you know, you have to decide if, if buying something with a tax uh, deed or treasurer's deed in the history is uh, into your own, own risk. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going to ask the, the roundtable what they would do if they would pass on a, on a, on a treasurer's deed or if they would not just avoid, you know, going to any type of, you know, auction situation. I think what's beautiful about our model is our letter writing strategy because we are actually getting these properties before they go to auction, ideally. But let's say, for example, that we miss it and it's a big auction. There's going to be a thousand properties. We can buy up maybe 50 of them, right? It might be worth going. So Tate Litchfield, would you pass on going and buying property at an auction, knowing that your deed is a treasurer's deed. No, I would buy them. You would buy them. Mm -hmm. Eric Peterson, a pass or a go? No, I would, I would buy them too. I've, <clears throat> I've actually bought some treasurer's deeds in the past. Um, typically when I get them, you know, from a letter writing campaign, uh, they're gonna be later in their term um, either typically I'll see them like in the five to seven year range, sometimes beyond that, but I don't usually see them sooner. Um, and at that, at that kind of range, like I don't mind, you know, taking on a couple of years of that and, and dealing with it if, you know, any issues come up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would, for the right price, I'm going to buy them at the beginning too. Right. Right. Mimi, how about you? No, I don't mess with them. When I read on the uh, one of the Colorado County's websites, it says you cannot warrant that property. I only sell properties with warranty deeds. So I just, I even thought, well, I could, if I sell it on terms, by the time the term is up, so will the, you know, the, the number of years needed. But no, I just haven't messed with them. You could do a special warranty deed, which essentially says that you are warranting that during the time of your ownership, there's yeah. been no liens or encumbrances or clouds in title. Yep. It's a good idea. I could do it that way. Yeah. Beerland Aaron, how about you? Would you, um, would you I, yeah, I them? buy them. There's. You buy them. Yeah, they're, right. um, I've got, especially in Colorado, there's only like one situation where I don't. Um, there's a couple, couple towns in this county I work where I find a lot of treasurer's deed because I'll run into people that uh, did, you know, tax deed or tax lien investing and ended up with the deed. And then they have so many properties, they kind of don't pay the taxes on them and they end up back on the list. So they get mailed to. And um, a lot of times, like Eric said, these have, they've owned them long enough that they're almost to the point where, you know, they're past, like if it's Colorado, the seven years um, or getting close already. Um, but there are a couple I don't, you know, if, if they're only maybe, uh, you know, it, you just have to kind of compare the value uh, of the property with, um, you know, if it's going to be buildable and you, it's an area that somebody's going to want to buy this and build on it, whether it's worth having the, the amount of money in it to do the quiet title action. Um, but a lot of times they shake out anyway, because if it's a high enough value area, the back taxes end up being so high in the property that it's not worth the buy anyway. So, um, but generally I'll buy them. I'll buy them. Jeannie? Well, I have one right now that I think I'm going to buy because the, the land is really cheap. But I'm thinking, now I have a question for all of you. I can quick claim that one though, can I? Or do I have to do a warranty deed? No, you can quick claim it. Well, that's what I was thinking Absolutely. of because it's cheap and I, I want to do it just so I can try it out and experiment and learn. But if I was your buyer, I might 
have an issue with it. Scott, would you buy on a quick claim deed? Uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I, I, back up for a minute. I, I don't prefer, I have done it. It just depends on the situation. So like the, the few times I've done it, it's actually been where I'm buying it because the attorney's the executor and he's just like, I'm not going to take responsibility for it. So it was a little bit different than, Hey, I'm just going to buy a quick claim, a property on a quick claim deed from Jeannie. I wouldn't do that. Right. Tate, how would you package it if you're Jeannie to the buyer? Meaning how would I sell it or? Yeah. How would you sell? How would you sort of explain to your, your buyer that, Hey, I'm going to convey ownership to you via a quick claim deed. And this is why I'm doing it this way. And this is what, you know, the pros and cons of doing it this way are. I mean, I would say exactly that. I would define how a quick deed, quick claim deed is different from a warranty deed. I would explain to them why I can't give them a warranty deed and let them know that, Hey, you're getting a great deal on this property because of the fact that it is a quick claim deed. If you want to go pay full price for something and buy it on a warranty deed, so be it. It's going to cost double, but Hey, if you want a cheap property, there you go. Yeah. I mean, you could even say, look, it depends on what your use is going to be with this yeah. property. If you're going to go out there and you want to build your dream home, this is not the property. This is not the property for you, but if you want to just use it recreationally from time to time, and the, here's some things you can do in the future if you want to, you know, be certain that there's no liens or encumbrances um, on this title. You just got to wait this amount of years and, or you can go through this company where you can go through a quiet title thing. So as the buyer, you have options, but as a seller, I'm not going to take any risk of liability and give you a warranty deed. I'm, this is why I'm doing it this way. But it's not like I'm just trying to pull the wool over your eyes, right? There's, there's a logic to it. Yeah, be transparent, think, yeah. right? Be transparent, be honest, be clear. But I mean, it's not my preferred way of doing business. But like Scott said, I've sold plenty of properties on a quick claim deed under Genie's circumstances. And I've just explained it to people. Hey, this is what it is. It is what it is. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Genie, does that help? Yeah, and you'd be surprised how many quick claim deeds I do. I do a lot. And the reason why is because when I first bought my first property, I bought it from an attorney. And he helped me through the whole process. And it's been working really good. I'm almost really embarrassed to tell you that. But I, 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 do, I do a lot of them. You know, it's so funny because Scott and I talk about this all the time. It's, usually it's our minds that are the, the barrier. Like it's, it's just in our imagination. Well, no one's going to buy a piece of property from me on a quick claim deed or no one's going to buy a piece of property if you know, it's a treasurer's deed or uh, this or this or that. But in reality, in the marketplace, don't judge it. Don't assume anything. And it's oftentimes we, we create our own sort of story that, well, if this, this, and this happened, that's no one's going to do this. Well, that's not the case. I mean, how many times do people push back Jeannie? I've not had one. Not one. I, I've been really, I'm really transparent though. I'll tell them whatever they want to know. So I, I, I've really worked hard to build trust with my, with my buyers. But again, I've, I've never had an issue. That's why this is really fun to talk about because I, I didn't, I didn't know. I've never had a problem. Yeah. Barely and Aaron. He, um, most often, um, I try to, you know, like you teach, we try to buy in a warranty deed. Um, when I buy quick claim, or I'm sorry, when I buy treasures deed properties, um, especially from these people that have been investors, they're savvy enough to know that they don't want to sell it to me on a warranty deed and they instantly try to quit claim it to me. But often enough, I can talk them into a special warranty deed because at least they can say, yeah, well, I've owned it, you know, I haven't encumbered it in any way or that sort of thing. So then I buy it on a special warranty deed and then I can sell it on a special warranty deed. And then the buyer is a little more assured that, you know, I'm not just quit claiming it. Now I'm selling it to them on a special warranty, just saying that while I've had it, I haven't encumbered it, you know? Um, and if, you know, like if they want a full warranty deed, then of course there's a little more work to it. They would have to go through some work, but um, you might be able to get a little more money for it if you sell it back on a special warranty. Yeah, I mean, you know, it made me think of is Nordstrom and Nordstrom Rack. 
Well, millions of people shop at Nordstrom Rack and they love it and they're getting a great deal and they know that, you know, there's might be something just a little off with that garment, right? Well, it's the same thing with raw land. So I don't think there's anything wrong, Jeannie, with you being Nordstrom Rack. Nordstrom Rack seems to be doing pretty well. I like it shopping at Nordstrom Rack. Yeah, you like the deal. It's like deal hunting. So you don't get a warranty deed. Big deal. You know, they don't do, it's like, it's like what is it? Like no, no return policy or, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, so you. So and hey, hey, my buyers get a really good deal from me because I get my land really cheap. So they're getting a good deal. I get a good deal and I pass it on to them. It's great. It's great. And well, the fact it's gone so well, I've actually had somebody buy two pieces of property from me because of that. Wow. Reason. Mm-hmm. That's phenomenal. We're never at that time in the podcast now where we get to put Eric on the spot and ask him for his tip of the week, a website, a book, a quote, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. Eric, the technician. I think it's Mike Zano's turn, but he's not even here. He, 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 he's, he does this all the time to Eric. It right, is Mike's yeah. turn because I had to fill in for him last week when he was yeah. here and he wasn't prepared. Yeah. So I'm going to take his approach today. I'm now going to go with a quote. All right. So <clears throat> start by doing what's necessary, then what do what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. That's from Francis of Assisi. So, okay, let's... Start by doing what's necessary. Then do what's possible. Then do what's possible. And suddenly you're doing the impossible. And then suddenly you're doing the impossible. Scott Todd, what are you showing there? What is that? <laughs> Scott Todd's tip of the week is. Wait, Scott, you're on you. All right, so, yeah. so what I'm telling you, Mark, here is that I'm like, man, that quote sure sounds familiar. And I went to my trusty old, my brand new red, black and red, black and red. And look at this. It's right there. All right. All right. It's right there in my best self planner. There you go. All right. All right. Well, Scott Todd, now that it's been a few weeks, how's it going with my tip of the week from a few weeks ago? The rocket book. Uh, I'm thinking about selling it over to Tate at a good discount. <laughs> really? It's, it's, so it's, I raced out. I had to have it, Mark. I had to have it. And now I'm like, eh, let me tell you why. I, you don't have this problem, or maybe you would, but I had a problem. You know what it was? What? Is I was out and I was, um, I was kind of out and I was writing some stuff. And then I got out of the car and it's, <laughs> It started to like sprinkle and um, that ink, when it gets wet, it smears. And I'm like, no, my notes. So uh, it's great if you're going to keep your stuff completely dry. And I live in Florida. And it's yeah, I mean, Tate, Tate, Jeannie and I don't even know what that is. Like, we're right. like, looking at the sky, like, what are those little wet things coming out of the sky? Yes. Yes. And in fact, while we were on this call, we had like a thunderstorm. There's, you know, like tropical storm out in the Gulf that's passing by and you get these waves come through. It's, you know, it's a, it's a Florida man problem, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want me to just Venmo you? What am I doing, Scott? How much am I paying you? You don't want, you don't want me to make an offer on that. $20, Twenty dollars, Tate. Twenty dollars, Scott. Oh my, he's making a he's making a God. profit on you, Tate. I know. I know. It even cost twenty dollars. Scott, my envelope. Thirty dollars. I'm gonna. It's pay used. You. I'm gonna offer you nine dollars. Nine. Not, yeah, that's a good deal. <laughs> Jeez. It would, be eight. it would be eight if I mailed you an offer. I, I think in Orlando we should do an auction <laughs> and have Scott like sign it. You know, if I get my thirty dollars back, back. Goes with it. <laughs> I think that thing could go for a couple hundred grand at live. Yeah, auction. but if it gets wet, the signature will go away. Then it's not worth anything. Hey, here, and now it just went down to zero. I will <laughs> write. I will sign it, and I will put your cell phone number in the cover. Bearland Aaron's? <laughs> no, yours. Mine? Oh. Oh, my cell phone. <laughs> 
Well, I thought this was a great podcast, by the way. And because uh, I know Tate's got a pretentious hard stop. I do have and, a pretentious um, hard stop. And uh, I want to just thank everyone for doing this. And I'm glad the technically, you know, the technical issues were resolved. And I want to thank all the listeners. Please do us a little favor. You got to subscribe. You got to re- rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We are going to send you for free our $97 passive income launch kit uh, for free. Also, toolkit owners, the toolkit's going to get a big upgrade. And uh, we're really excited about that. Be on the lookout for that. If you have the toolkit, you're gonna, when you log in, you'll see all the upgrades. Um, Ed is coming very, very soon. Uh, we're putting the finishing touches on that. And we actually are starting a new module, the tax and legal modules. So your tax and legal questions are going to be answered every month. It's going to be updated in the toolkit. It is going to be phenomenal. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And uh, last but not least, I just want to remind everybody, today's podcast is sponsored by our own Flight School. So learn more about Flight School, how to accelerate the next 14 weeks, and have Scott Todd be your personal Sherpa, taking you up the mountain of land investing. Just go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training, schedule a call with Mike, the Zen master, or Scott, dude buddy, Bossman. All right. Please do that. And uh, are we ready? One. One, two, two three. three. Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Not bad. It's like it takes barely giving an effort. <laughs> I was distracted. <laughs> like, I got to do this. But, He's not hear that at all. He's not letting his wife hear that at all. Yeah, spe- speaking speaking of freedom, right now in my house. Am, am I the only one watching Handmaid's Tale right now on Hulu? No, yes. I watched. Anyone that. else watching it? I watched it. Whew. Kept me up for weeks. Boy, yeah, man, I'm not sleeping well. I can't watch that thing at night. <laughs> it's a daytime show. It's definitely a daytime show. I am disturbed, but then you've got <laughs> little things here and there that are like real and kind of like you know smell of it. That's what's even more disturbing. But I don't want to get into it. Tate's like, what? No, I, same thing. That's a, that's a slippery slope to go down. We don't have time for that. We don't have time. No. Hey, speaking of uh, media and viewing, I got Ready Player One on DVD a couple weeks ago. And I actually watched the, uh, the extra features on that. And uh, it sounds to me like the author's going to be writing a sequel, book-wise. Oh, nice. I think it'll be like Ready Player Two, maybe, or something like that. I don't know, but I'm, I'm really excited to see if if that comes to fruition. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. By the way, speaking of books, I just downloaded this audio book. It is so disturbing. <laughs> not as disturbing as Handmaid Tales. Actually, maybe more disturbing because Handmaid Tales is not real. And this is actually real. Bad Blood. Secrets and lies in a, in a Silicon Valley startup about the story of Theranos. Ooh, wow. isn't it bad? Yikes. Is he a Florida man? What's that? Is he a Florida man? Well, no, it's Elizabeth Holmes. She is not a Florida man that started it. But there are definitely, let's just say, um, let's just say her moral compass was like completely broken. Like, like some people like there's, their moral compass is a little off. Like hers was like just broke. Brilliant. Driven. Like take, like combine Elon Musk and, uh, you know, I don't know. Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, no, no, not like that. Um, who's who's a who's a like like a like a like a brilliant scientist? Um, so driven. Then you got like a like like a brilliant scientist. Let's say Anne Marie Curie. Is that Anne Curie? Is that her name? I don't know. I forget my my. <coughs> but anyways, Adam Curie my, and and who? Madam Curie? Madam, is it Madam Curie? No, it's the scientist. Anne Curie is, is, is news. 
not no, so it's not her. You know what I'm talking about? Madam carries the smallpox inventor, right? Is okay, it yeah, yeah. So the small, so take the smallpox inventor, combine with Elon Musk, and then the, um, let's say, the the ethical, <laughs> the ethical uh, compass of I don't know, like just like a like like Bernie a, Madoff. Bernie Madoff. So combine those three, and you, you get the story. I mean, it is crazy. I'm not done with it, but like, I'm really enjoying it. Bad blood. So it's good. It's a good little tale. And it actually kind of reminds you, like when you're in business, like don't think about today, right? When you're making business decisions, like think about, well, how's this going to, you know, if I make this decision and I read about it in the New York Times a year from now, would I still make that decision? It might change your mind, you know? I don't know. Anyways, uh, thanks everybody. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. You too. See you later, man. See ya. Bye bye.